Hello everyone, my name is Zhao Kong Han, and I'm a third year PhD candidate working under the supervision of Professor J.V. Rajendran at Texas A&M University. I'm glad to talk about our upcoming work, does logic locking work with EDA tools? Before going over the specifics of logic locking, let me briefly introduce the supply chain security threats in hardware. These threats are IP privacy and overbuilding, reverse engineering, IC counterfeiting, and insertion of hardware trojans. Various countermeasures such as watermarking, split manufacturing, IC camouflaging, and logic locking have been proposed to safeguard the hardware from these threats. From this table, we can observe that logic locking is the holistic countermeasure that could defend against all these threats. Logic locking plays an important role because of its ability to defend against different types of threats from untrusted entities in the IC supply chain. Moving on, let me explain what is logic locking. Logic locking is an IP protection technique which modifying the functionality of the circuit by changing the logic controlled by key input. Only with the correct key value, the locked circuit functions correctly. Conversely, with an incorrect key, the locked circuit functions incorrectly. The secret key is stored in the temporal proof memory, and our threat model assumes that the attacker has no access to this temporal proof memory. The process of logic locking is shown as follows. Starting from an original circuit, after logic locking and constructing the locks circuit in the end. Here's an example for a circuit protected by logic locking when applying with the crack key for an arbitrary input pattern, the output is always cracked, but when applying with an incrack key, there exists an input pattern resulting in round output. This table showcases the existing attacks and defenses in logic locking. The attacks are broadly classified into query-based attacks and structural attacks. From this table, we can observe that the point function and CAC techniques are resilient to query-based attacks. Additionally, we also observe that CAC RAM is the only technique that can that can defend against all these existing attacks. Now I will discuss about cropped and corrected, which is known as CAC or stripped functionality logic locking. A circuit protected by CAC usually contains two main components, a cropped circuit and a corrected unit. The cropped circuit differs only if the input is one of the protected input patterns, which are known as PIPs. Hence, we can get this conditional inequality. Only if the crack key key is applied, the cracking unit can help to crack the flipped output resulted by the PIPs. The circuit protected by CAC can defend against query-based attacks. CAC RAM is the technique that keeps unbroken since 2020. In this technique, the construction of the corrupted circuit is achieved by inserting a stacked fault in the original circuit, which removes partial logic. The structure of the corrupted circuit in CAC RAM provides the good resilience against existing structural attacks. Here, I will talk about the interplay between logic synthesis and logic locking. Logic synthesis is the process which converts a given RTL design into a netlist consisting of basic gates like AND gate, OR gate, etc. It is carried out using a synthesis tool as shown in the yellow box. There are many synthesis tools such as Synopsis Design Compiler, 
cadence genus, and mental graphics precision. Here is an example to show how logic synthesis manifests in logic locking. The first figure is for the K map of the original circuit. If we implement CAC techniques and add the mean term 0, 0, 0, 0 as the PIP, the K map of the crafty circuit is represented in this figure. Similarly, if we choose the mean term 1, 1, 1, 1 as the PIP, and remove it from the original circuit. The key map of the crafty circuit is represented in this figure. Next, I'm going to talk about our proposed sparse prime implicant attack. When the circuit has more primary inputs, getting the key map is infeasible. In such a scenario, we use the prime implicant table, PEAT, to handle this challenge. There are some definitions. Implicant is the queue that only covers onset mean terms. Prime implicant is the implicant that can never be covered by any other implicant. And sparse prime implicants are the PIs, which are far away from the rest of the PIs in the PID. We leverage the SPIs in the attack process as discussed it next. Here are some different stages in the SPI attack. In the first step, the SPI attacker obtains the locked netlist and extracts the cryptic circuit. Later, the attacker converts the cryptic circuit into its prime implicant table. By analyzing the PIs in the cryptic circuit's PID, the attacker can gather some potential PIDs. After PID verification, the attacker can recover the PID of the original circuit from the corrupted circuit's PID. Finally, the attacker can obtain the original circuit. Next, I will showcase the effectiveness of our proposed attack. As can be observed in this table, our attack can break all the competition circuits. Note that none of the previous attacks can break all the lock circuit. These log circuits are from the first ever CISO's logic locking competition held in 2019. No team was able to break this log circuit during the competition. To summarize, our proposed SPI attack can break all the circuit, while the other attacks cannot. There are some other details in this work. Converting the PIT from the corrupted circuit is an NP-hard problem. In the worst case, this conversion will cause exponential time complexity to the size of the inputs. In this work, we also put forward another version of the SPI attack that utilizes the approach of divide and conquer. The SPI attack, considering divide and conquer, can solve the scalability problem well and break the large-scale lock circuit efficiently. The reason why SPI attacks are powerful is that most randomly chosen PIPs are far away from other PIs in the corrupted circuit's PID. Thus, these isolated PIs hold high chance to leak secret. In this work, we also put forward a security property that for PIs that are far away from all the other PIs in the original circuit's PID, they are named as D2 pips. And D2 pips are secure to structural attacks if being chosen as the protected input patterns. However, the reality is in benchmark circuits, there are limited D2 pips. And these D2 pips are vulnerable to brute force attack. So it is unclear that shall we use this D2 pips in logic locking research? To overcoming this shortcoming, this paper gives a potential solution. Researchers could encode the original circuit and enlarge the size of the inputs in order to increase the number of D2 pips existing in the original circuit. Further, this potential solution can be resulting high power, performance, and area overhead. Therefore, 
it is necessary to have a better trade-off between the security and the overhead. Thank you everyone for attending this presentation. If you are interested in our work, you can contact with me through my personal page, email, or TAMU SCTH lab webpage. Thank you.